Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to theCUBE's day one coverage of CrowdStrike Falcon 23, live from Caesars Palace in sunny, warm Las Vegas. I'm Lisa Martin here with Dave Vellante. We're going to have a very cool conversation next. We're going to be talking about the FBI. We're also going to be talking about that breach you may have heard about that happened here uh, very recently. Please welcome Mark Bowling, Chief Information Security and Risk Officer at ExtraHop. Mark, great to have you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. It's to speak with both of you and to speak to, you, to your customers yeah. here. Yeah, you worked with the FBI for what, 20 years? That's correct. Tell I us was, a little bit about that history. I was an FBI special agent. I started in Washington, D.C., which was a really cool place to start. I actually worked with other agencies doing some of the technical things here in the United States that statutorily they're not allowed to do, and that's all I'm going to say about it. I can't tell you what I did, can't <laughs> tell you the tools I used, can't tell you how I did it. After about four years, I went to Wisconsin, and that was when we started setting up cyber programs nationwide. While I was in D.C., I worked very closely with the National Computer Crime Squad. Uh, it was C-17 at the time in Tyson's Corner, but then in, uh, when I went to Wisconsin, they started pushing cyber squads out because of the growth of cybercrime to each of the states. So I was the cybercrime coordinator there in Wisconsin. I had a, a brief interlude right after 9-11 where I went back to headquarters and I worked on Director Mueller's staff. I was a subject matter expert for both cyber and uh, counterterrorism. I worked on a, a technical project out of his office. And then I became a supervisor in Detroit where I was uh, had a cyber task force that reported to me, cyber crime task force, did a lot of great uh, internet crimes against children work. Um, ICAC is a wonderful program. And then following that, uh, I went to Arkansas in 2010 as a field executive. It's called an assistant special agent in charge, so I was the number two, I was the assistant. It means I got all the nasty jobs that the boss didn't <laughs> want to do, you know how those executives are. And uh, spent my last five years with the FBI there in that capacity, and then I went to another agency, Department of Education Office, the Inspector General, where I was in charge of nationwide of their technology crimes. So it was a great federal career, as you're both a law enforcement officer and an intelligence officer, and it was, it was a privilege to serve the American people and it was a privilege to serve in that capacity. Fascinating, well thank you for your service. Thank Talk you. a little bit about, maybe compare and contrast your current role with ExtraHop to what you were doing back in, what, what you can say with what yeah, you did Yeah, it, so it's, it's really cool when you're in the federal government, you have all these well-documented rules that you have to follow. So like when we built uh, the system that we designed, uh, IDW, Investigative Data Warehouse, it was the first federated data warehouse that the uh, FBI built, and this was right after 9-11. When we did that, we had very specific what we called certification and accreditation. There were rules, and so we had a NIST standard, 853, now we're on revision five, it was revision three at the time, but NIST 853, gave us all of the controls we needed to implement in that system. So sometimes it's different because the control frameworks are different. If you're in healthcare, you generally start with HIPAA. If you are in financial services and you're a bank, it's Graham Leach Bliley. If you are doing any kind of equities or stock trading, it's FINRA or FFIEC. Those are all, well, the stock trading is all um, governed or regulated by the SEC. So we had very specific, so it's different in that the frameworks that you implement are different and the, I would say the maturity of the business practices are much higher in the federal government, particularly like in the FBI, which is part of the intelligence community. But on the other hand, you still have to do the right things. So you always want to start out with a technology framework that you're using. Are you going to use uh, the Center for Internet Security top 18 critical security controls? Or are you going to use the NIST cybersecurity framework? They tell you what to use in the government and you have to implement those controls. But in the, in the commercial world, it depends on the industry largely and but you still have to have a framework, you still have to have a roadmap that you need to implement. So your choices may be different, but you still have the same process. Many government agencies 
Some anyway, take the IRS for instance, they're behind on technology relative to say their commercial counterparts. My sense has always been that the intelligence community is not behind when it comes to things like cyber and threat intelligence. Um, I, I wonder if you could discuss the, the role of public and private partnerships, specifically as it pertains to cybersecurity. What's the state of that? Are we, where are we? Is, how mature is it? Are we doing enough? What can be done? Well, so you need to understand that there's multiple critical infrastructures. I think DHS, Department of Homeland Security, they, they've identified 17 individual critical infrastructures. Some of those are very mature, like the electrical power industry under NERC, North American Energy Reliability Corporation. They are very mature. They have that locked down. On the other hand, you have maybe like the pipeline operators like Colonial, uh, Colonial Pipeline on the East Coast, and they weren't that mature. So they literally had to shut down their entire operational technology um, environment because their enterprise IT environment was hacked, and they weren't able to demonstrate that you couldn't transition, you couldn't move laterally from the enterprise IT environment to the operational technology environment. So the level of maturity is dependent on the infrastructure. Uh, healthcare, they're all over the map. You have small, um, in many cases, rural hospitals don't have the money. They're not as mature. I was talking to an, an amazing hospital that uses our tool uh, on the East Coast in, in Carolinas, and they're very mature. So even in a specific infrastructure like healthcare, you have a wide variety or a wide variation or a wide um, spectrum of maturity and capability. Very situational. Yes, absolutely. So I wonder if we could talk about the um, what's in the news, the MGM hack and the Caesars hack. I was out here last week and I was delayed. We pulled in, you know, MGM is big green, lion, all lit up. Yep. It, was, it was dark, no neon lights. Wow. Right. There were probably of the thousands of rooms, there were maybe 50 to 100 lights on in the hotel. Now we were at the Aria, across the street, and they had you know, part of that hack. Yeah. And you had to manually, they had to manually write down the credit cards. I'm like, what are you doing with that data? Exactly. Now, it was interesting, is this week, coming into you know, Caesars, no problem. Um, so, quite different, but what, what do you and your colleagues in the, the SecOps world know about this? What can you share with us? So, uh, I think we know the same thing most people know. I've read some very, very, very insightful uh, pot washes or lessons learned about the MGM hack specifically. That was done almost exclusively by social engineering. Mm. People went on LinkedIn, they identified information, they picked up the phone, and they called people until they found a, a soft nut to crack. And it just, it, it's almost, ridiculous, it, it borderlines on absurd. I find it shocking that enterprises that have the kind of money going through them, okay, so it's all about the money. They have a lot of money going through Caesars Palace, they have a lot of money going through MGM Grand, that they wouldn't have more mature processes to train yeah. or to create awareness in their personnel. Now, I'm sure and I, I'm not trying to be an apologist for them, I'm sure that both MGM Grand and Caesars occasionally have job retention issues and may have trouble hiring and meeting all of their staffing requirements, and so that, that can impact your ability to ensure that your people are aware, as aware as they need to be. But if you're somebody who can answer the phone and, and give out information that can cause the entire enterprise to be compromised, they should at least be trained up and they should have the kind of level of awareness and the level of operational maturity that they, they can see this type of activity coming and take the appropriate action. It's it a classic case of bad user behavior yeah. beats good security exactly. every time. Exactly, absolutely. Mean, yeah. <laughs> the awareness piece is so critical because the, the weakest link is always the human and we saw it yet again with this one. Absolutely. Didn't MGM pay, was it MGM or Caesars that paid 15 million of the demand of 30 million? I believe it was MGM. I, I think so I, too. I was looking more at the how it happened, and then once it happened, 
how they responded. I, I didn't pay that much attention to any payments that were made. But, but I mean, wh what does a business do? I mean, if, you know, the guidance is don't pay the ransom because then you're just enabling right. these, these criminals. Right. But then your business is down, you're negotiating with these people. Well, instead of 15, can I pay you, you know, five? Because that's uh, getting the cash. Um, and of course, if you pay a ransom to a rogue state, that's illegal. Yeah. Absolutely. You can't pay money to North Korea. You can't do that. So it's a really difficult situation. What do you advise customers who ask you, should I pay the ransom? Well, I, from a national security and a law enforcement perspective, I'm going to repeat what the FBI says. You don't pay the ransom because all you're doing is encouraging bad behavior. Mm -hmm. I, have, I have five adult children, okay? Three of them were at one time high school boys between uh, 15 and 18. And so I learned that you don't encourage bad behavior. <laughs> you don't reward bad behavior because that just encourages more bad behavior. And so what you, when you pay the ransom, you're encouraging bad behavior. And so I think as much as possible, don't pay the ransom, but here's the way I say, why don't you pay the ransom up front? And when you pay the ransom up front, why don't you have effective backups, and why don't you have effective security? You can buy a lot of security. I guarantee for $15 million, I could have secured MGM Grand. That's not that heavy a lift with that much money, okay? So, if, so why don't we pay the ransoms ahead of time and implement the type of effective security and get the effective training for the personnel so that you reduce your surface attack area and you reduce your human failure factor? Yeah, so that was kind of my next, question was, what is your role at Extra Hop? Talk about both the internal and the external, and how you protect Extra Hop customers and maybe advise them. Okay, so I, I do three things. Uh, first of all, I'm our, our chief risk, security, and information security officer. So I have risk management, and I, I like that because if you're going to do security, you want to start with risk management. Mm -hmm. You don't just do physical security and cybersecurity out of the box, no. You take a look at what are your risk factors. What can you afford to lose? What can't you afford to lose? We have a lot of proprietary information, critical business information. We cannot afford to lose that. So, I, so we have a very, very strong risk management program. Enterprise risk identification, quantification, and then effective management. We treat our risk. I'm responsible for physical and facility and most of all, personnel security. Remember those people who answered the phone and gave out the passwords? That's poor personnel security. So I'm responsible for personnel security, which means I also protect our people here, okay? I'm concerned deeply about every extra hop employee here at, extra, at uh, um, Falcon. And then third, I have the standard CISO type roles where it's identity management, access management, and the whole range of technology controls and administrative controls that we implement to protect our cyber assets. So those are the three things I do. Now, inside that, that um, those roles, I'm also customer facing. I've met with several customers here. I, I'm part of our uh, CISO. Uh, we call it a cab board, customer advisory board, but I interact with our CISOs there. So I do have some customer facing roles. Internally, my job is to implement controls to protect our people and our assets. And as part of that, I also protect our customers' information that we have in our tool, our, our, our product, okay? So I protect our customers' data uh, probably more assiduously than even I protect our own data. So those are the things I do. But you're, the sales guys must be trying to drag you out all the time. Yeah. They, they are. <laughs> and, and I. I was actually going to go up to an FS ISAC meeting, financial services ISAC meeting in New York, and I said, well, how many customers are we going to meet? And they said, well, 10 of them. I said, I'm not sure I could travel <laughs> for 10. <laughs> but I would love, you know, I was, I was with Goldman Sachs right before I came to, to Extra Hop. So I love the financial services sector. I love the FS ISAC. I love New York City. I don't want to live there, but I love visiting the city. And so it's like, but I have to make a choice. I have a full-time job I have to do as well as meeting our customers. So 10X that and I'll, I'll get in the plane. Yeah, yeah. If, if you give me 40 or 50, <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll hop on a plane. And part of it is, it's a monster of my own making. I live in central Arkansas, so to get anywhere 
from Central Arkansas can be difficult. Yeah, yeah. not so easy. Yeah. You, you mentioned uh, working for Goldman Sachs. We talked about your tenure at the FBI and your service there. So you've worked as a CISO in different industries. How is it different uh, in your role for a cybersecurity company? So th that's what's interesting is the cybersecurity company, we're not publicly traded, we're, we're privately held right now, so we don't have to worry about what's called SOX, Sarbanes-Oxley 404. So we don't have to worry about SOX 404, but we're going to get there. That's one of our priorities. We're going to get there with SOX 404. But what we have to worry about is our reputation. I'm not worried about um, uh, Office of Civil Rights for Health and Human Services coming in and doing a HIPAA failure investigation, okay? We're not going to have any HIPAA breaches. We don't run the electrical power grid, so I'm not worried about NERC coming in and having, you know, hitting us with compliance failures. So everything is about the reputation and everything is about our customer, okay? And, and there are, there are uh, bad guys out there, there are criminal enterprises who are headhunting for cybersecurity companies. We had a, I don't remember it right off the top of my head, but there was a cybersecurity company about three months ago that was hacked. And the first thing I did is sent out an email to everybody and said there are scalp hunters, they're out there, they're taking scalps, and we are the kind of scalp they want to take. So we have to elevate our game. We, and so instead of saying, okay, did I meet an arbitrary set, not arbitrary, but a defined set of compliance requirements such as HIPAA or NERC or FFIEC, no. I have to make sure that all of our controls are buttoned down because we have to protect our proprietary data as well as our customers' operational data. You can't just check the boxes. We, I, I am not about checking boxes. Well, how do you work with CrowdStrike? What's your relationship with them? Uh, that is just such an amazing relationship. CrowdStrike's an amazing company, okay? So CrowdStrike has, and I want you to think of what I'm going to call the, the uh, SOC triad. And so you have SIM, which is a, a SOAR or a SIM would be a tool such as, um, well, it's Humio or LogScale now for mm -hmm. CrowdStrike. It could be another tool such as Splunk yep. or Logarithm, okay? And then you have NDR and EDR. Now, what I want you to think about is whenever you have a computer intrusion, you have three things. You have one host here, you have one host here, and then you have transactions between those two hosts. And what CrowdStrike Falcon does is it locks down these two hosts. What we do is we observe these transactions between the two hosts, okay? So we have EDR at the endpoints, we have NDR, network detection and response, at the networks, and then CrowdStrike, because they purchased Humio, now have log scale, they have the SIM built in. So what we do is we, we complete that triangle. All right, so CrowdStrike has log scale as a SIM, they have their Falcon as EDR, they have XDR, their managed detection response service, Falcon complete, and so what we do is we fill that one thing that they don't have, and we do it at scale and we do it for enterprises, okay? So let's talk about the three ways we work together. Um, Tom Etheridge is in, is in charge of their um, security or their uh, global managed services, okay? They do incident response. Whenever they go into an existing XTROP customer, they know to pick up the phone and say, we found XTROP in this environment, and then we have trained up their, their incident responders on how to use XTROP when they're doing an incident response in an environment where XTROP may be. So we're integrated from a managed services perspective uh, for incident response. We're also integrated directly with the Falcon tool, okay? So we have APIs, application for, uh, programming interfaces, that connect ExtraHop to those endpoints. So if ExtraHop sees something, we can send an alert to the endpoint, the EDR endpoint detection response, and then that endpoint can either shut down or can deny that connection. And then finally, we now have that connection directly to log scale. And so we've, we've signed an agreement and we're working on the technology to integrate log scale as our back-end data store. So right now, for our, our typical 
enterprise customers, we use Google BigQuery. Mm -hmm. That's our record store for uh, 360 in the cloud. But now, if you are an existing CrowdStrike customer, now log scale. You have the option as a customer, you can select log scale to become your enterprise record data store. And so that just makes the integration between ExtraHop and CrowdStrike that much better. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw, you know, I love working with Tom Etheridge and his, his staff. Uh, they're, they're great guys. And, you know, I remember Sean Henry, who's the chief security yeah. officer at CrowdStrike from the FBI, you know. And, and so it's, it's great to have these relationships that we're able to capitalize on. And it makes working together that much easier and, and that much more effective for the customer. It's That's not it. all about convenience for us. Yeah. It's about making it as effective as possible for the customer. And that's really what the CrowdStrike x relationship brings. Uh, it sounds like a great, deeply integrated partnership. Barclay, Absolutely. Thank you so much for coming on, talking about your history with the FBI, your service there. Again, thank you for that. What ExtraHop and CrowdStrike are doing and what you're enabling customers to achieve exactly. as the threat is no longer, is it going to happen? It's a matter of when. We exactly. really appreciate your insights and your time. This was fascinating, thank you. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you thank both you, very Our much. Pleasure. I appreciate it. For our guests and for Dave Vellante, I'm Lisa Martin. You're watching theCUBE Live, day one of our coverage of CrowdStrike Falcon 23. We're going to be back after a short break, so we'll see you soon.